Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Hi friend, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the high intensity training podcast to help you improve your own health and your physique, become a great personal trainer or start and grow your hit business. My former guests include the who's who in hit like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Jim Flanagan, health, fitness and nutrition giants like Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, successful hit entrepreneurs and exercise scientists like Luke Carlson, Dr. James Fisher, Dr. Jürgen Giesing and many, many more. This episode is also brought to you by the Hit Business Membership. This is an online blueprint to help you grow your hit business, including exclusive content on sales, marketing, hiring, pricing, retention, and personal training, monthly Q&As of experts, and high-grade community full of thought leaders and hit entrepreneurs. If you're interested, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash membership. Today's guest is Jeff Casebolt, PhD, who is a PhD in biomechanics and instructor at the West Texas A&M University. He has been associated with the fitness industry since 1991, working as a personal trainer, strength and conditioning coach, and corporate fitness coordinator. Jeff is also the director of biomechanical research at Dynavec Multidirectional Resistance Systems. You can contact Jeff and Dynavec via dynavecmd.com, that's D-Y-N-A-V-E-C-M for Mike, delta.com, or email Jeff to dynavec at outlook.com. You can also find Dynavec on Instagram, at dynavecmd, and Facebook at Dynavec. Dynavec have recently become a popular provider of exercise machines that provide a unique multi-directional function that forces the muscle to work in two planes of motion. In particular, the iconic gluteator, a machine that effectively stimulates the glutes, has become really popular among bodybuilders, bikini model competitors, and high-intensity trainers. In this episode, we talk about Dynavec's first few years in business and the various trials and tribulations they had to overcome. Jeff describes how they almost accidentally discovered a couple of target markets who showed enormous interest in their machines and how a few big social influencers really helped get the ball rolling. The business history behind Dynavec is absolutely fascinating. If you're in the machine exercise machine business, or you're interested in getting into that business in the future, you will find this absolutely fascinating because it's not been easy and still continues not to be easy and quite challenging. Although 
uh, Jeff and and Kent, who are, is the the CEO of the business, are getting a lot more interest now. It's a very very challenging marketplace. Um, you know, certainly from Jeff's perspective, you know, he's an exercise scientist who's coming into the world of business and really felt quite uncomfortable and didn't know how to execute well in business and really had to show a lot of humility to learn how to play this game. And he's um, certainly done that. And you can tell he's really learned a lot about how to go to market with this particular business they've created. So it's absolutely fascinating. And if you're only interested in business, you will find this aspect or this part of the podcast very interesting indeed. And um, we also talk about, uh, also, I should say, Jeff really puts his PhD to the test. Uh, and we go into an immense amount of detail on exercise science and biomechanics to describe how the machines differ from other machines on the market in terms of their ability to stimulate target muscle groups in a potentially more effective manner. Lastly, Jeff describes why hip business owners decided to acquire the gluteator and the benefit it's had on their business. And we talk about much, much more than that. For the show notes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Dunavec. And without any further ado, I give you Jeff Casebolt. Jeff, welcome to Corporate Warriors. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. So i um, really excited to, to talk to you. Uh, obviously, we've spoken a bit before and got to know each other a little bit, which was really useful. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously very aware of the Dynavec sort of product range. Um, you know, I've seen a number of people, a number of my listeners and friends of mine demonstrate the products, uh, especially the Gluteator. Um, but I'd, before we get into any of that, I'd love to learn about you, um, just to give the audience um, more context on your career, where you come from, uh, and then we can get into, you know, the, the business a little bit more. But yeah, tell us your story. Well, my story with Dynavec started in, in the mid 2000s. Um, I was, I was finishing up a PhD in biomechanics when now my business partner walked into the building and asked my mentor, my boss, um, if we would do an assessment. And we sat around, I got pulled into the meeting because of my strength background and I'll get into that in a second. But we sat around a big table and we discussed all the different possibilities and and uh, my business partner Kent folks now my business partner Kent folks left my 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 mentor was like I, I want nothing to do with it it's it's going nowhere and I'm like um let's let's play with this you know let's see and at the time we had um, a couple of uh, foreign exchange students who had physical therapy backgrounds who were doing a master's in the United States that way they could practice physical or physiotherapy here in the states and we wrote up a, a study and we got started on the study and I oversaw it um, as the as the graduate coordinator, graduate coordinator for our lab at the time. And as what we decided to do was to compare this gluteator machine to a Cybex um, AB Dux machine. We're looking at single plane versus multi-plane release resistance. And then we threw a barbell squat in there just for giggles. And we just were just trying to see what was going on. And as as we had our subjects, our kind of our case study get going on this, we had our subjects using the machine. I've got EMGs on their backside. I'm looking at them moving. I'm looking down at the computer. I'm looking at the output. And I'm like, Wow there's something here. There's really something here. We need to explore this more. And it was outside of my scope of, um, not my understanding, but it was just, it was revolutionary for me personally, given my background. And so what I ended up doing is I, I took all this information, I wrote it up, I, I, we ran stats on it, the whole thing. And I went to Kent folks who was the gentleman who brought the machine to us and I said here's here's what our assessment is this is these are things you need to consider doing and at the time he goes can I hire you and I said no but I said I, I really want you to make it I want to be a part of this experience if you if if we put time and energy in this and this turns into a business I just I want to be a part of the business I want to grow with you or you know maybe be partners or whatever it happens to be and so we that was in like I said late mid to late 2000s and 
you know, we kind of floundered for a long time in terms of what we should do. We had all kinds of people telling us how to start a business, what to do, and we were listening to everybody and not making any decisions. You and probably have to ignore eighty percent of that, though, right? <laughs> uh, in hindsight, yeah, but I mean. I I was a science geek. I wasn't a businessman. I was taking anybody who, you know, on a street corner was telling us what to do. I was listening because it was outside of my scope of knowledge, you know. And then Kent, you know, his background's probably even further away from being a businessman. So anyway, what ended up happening was is we ultimately in 2014, we finally decided, okay, this is it. This is the product. Let's let's go forward with this. After we tried all this other stuff and we went to the Ursha conference in San Diego and we spent quite a bit of money to be there and we got absolutely no attention. I think there was one gentleman by the name of Pete Brown at Capital Fitness in um in Madison, Wisconsin who ultimately ended up buying a piece several years later, but that was the only sale that we got from the event two years post. The drive home from San Diego back to Texas, um, we're based out of Dallas, Texas, was I don't think we spoke until Albuquerque. I mean, I don't think Kent and I had a conversation. We didn't exchange words. We were both in this place of just, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Like, what's going on? And it was in Albuquerque, I just kind of said, there's two things we need to focus in on. One is we have to figure out what our demographic is. And two, we have to find somebody to invite us to the dance. We have to find somebody who knows this industry better than we know it and see if they'll invite us um, because we weren't able to break down the doors. And what I mean by that is my my mentality going into that weekend, this Ursha conference was feel the dreams. If we build it, they will come. Like it's a perfect machine for glute development. That's That was my mentality. And I realized that weekend, it doesn't matter what the science says or what we say about the machine. We needed somebody to say nice things about our product because somewhere in our community that the the person selling the equipment, they're supposed to say nice things. And so we've really developed some issues trusting people who are making products or testing products or doing or associated with the product. So looking for someone who understood what the machine did was pivotal for us. And within a few months, we, we found somebody reached out to us and that's when the ball started to roll for us, proverbially speaking. But my background, if you go way back to when I was a young man, 18 years of age, I, um, I tore my ACL and I tore my ACL because of a high school coach who did not have enough knowledge to be teaching strength training to these young men. And I can state that conclusively because there were several of us out of my class who suffered the same injury within a short period of time post high school. So we made it through high school injury free, but then we suffer, we have suffered as people thereafter. And, um, as I had my surgery and I went through my rehabilitation, as I went through this thing called the library and did research and tried to figure out why I got hurt, what did I do wrong, you know, what could I have done differently, it it sparked something in my brain that just has set the course of my life. If I had not torn my ACL, I probably wouldn't be on this podcast. I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing for a living because – excuse my language, but it pissed me off. You know, I wanted to know what happened. Why did I, why did I suffer this? And diving into that pool was interesting because what I initially found out is, you know, what is common knowledge is not not necessarily truth. And the, the, what I mean by that is there's a lot of myth in our science, a lot of myth in our weight rooms, a lot of myth that people talk about that really isn't substantiated in the sciences. And so when you start seeing this as a young man, it really sets the course of or the direction of what you want to do. And that's when I was young. And then I went and trained for strength conditioning coach with the idea of proving that there was a better way to work with young people in a weight room to, you know, increase joint congruency to develop strength, to transfer the strength into sport. Um, I just figured there was a better way to do this. And um, 
I did that for about 15 years of my life. And then I started to realize that there were too many injuries as a result of somewhere between in that gap, somewhere between what we're doing in a weight room and what was doing in what we were doing on a field diamond court track or pitch. And as a result, um, I found uh, a program that I wanted to be a part of in amazing laboratory facilities, had the opportunity and went to do ACL um, research. And then when I got there, the school had just secured a very large NIH grant on elderly fall prevention. So my ACL career at PhD level was incredibly short lived, a few months at most. And then as a result of that, um, I went into the forensic sciences post graduation and worked as a forensics biomechanist. And I really believe that's where I learned research, um, learned how to question things, learned how to develop, learned how to see things all the way through because it gives you a different perspective than, say, academics. That's my story. Awesome. No, thanks for still sort of setting the scene. So you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the inception um, of Dynavec already. Um, but do you want to mm-hmm. talk about some of the challenges you've had in terms of, you know, finding the right market, finding the right customer and sort of growing that business? Because it seems like now a lot of people, a lot of big names, especially in the high intensity world, are raving about it. So it sounds like things are going great from where I'm standing. So tell me about how that how that's transformed over time. Well, initially, as I said, we needed someone to invite us to the dance. And um, there's a, uh, a lady who was a competitive um, bikini slash figure. Um, she was kind of somewhere in between. And she reached out to us and wanted to purchase the machine because she had used it at a gym called Stroud's in, I believe, Bedford, Texas. And she no longer had access to the gym and wanted the piece for herself. And um, I got on the phone and spoke to her. She's incredibly dynamic. She's very well connected in the industry. And we went ahead and um, got her a piece, got her a gluteator, set it up. And she was amazingly appreciative. And as a result, she took a liking to us. Um, We jokingly call her our fairy godmother. Um, She reached in and and showed us things about the industry. We had no idea. I mean, just a couple of dumb blokes trying to figure it out. And so ended up um, um, as a result of that relationship. uh, Then it was Amanda Latano. But now it's Amanda Kuklo. Amanda releases a video um, on her social network, social media. And within days, hours, I had people calling me that wouldn't talk to me six months prior. They wouldn't return our phone calls. They wouldn't have conversations. They wouldn't answer our emails. And now we're best friends. And so Amanda, I always make this joke, but Amanda's who taught us the power of the social media, the social network at the time. And the social proof. That's the biggest thing. Someone else talking about your product rather than yourself, right? Absolutely. And, you know, she's, she's personable. She's a dynamic. She's, she has all the intangibles that you want. And as proof, I mean, since that video's release, she has now gone on and, and has marketed successfully marketed her own product and has been on shark tank and is kind of a social media phenom in that sense. Um, her husband, Steve is, you know, uh, been on the Olymp- Olympia stage. Um, I think, uh, two or three times out of the last several years. And I think he's making a comeback this year. I think, I think he took last year off, but they've been amazingly good to us um, in terms of raising social uh, awareness within a particular market. And that market was the figure bodybuilding bikini competitor. Um, more so the bikini, because the, the saying, as the saying goes in on, on stage for bikini, you win from behind. And so the shape of your glutes, the glute hamstring tie in that that particular muscle attachment becomes imperative 
for the bikini competitor to rise or to to make it to the pro level and go beyond. Um, what what our machine does is it isolates the glutes. And a couple of stories that I'll share with you is um, we had several young ladies who reached out to us who were quad dominant. And so whenever they did traditional glute exercises that involved, you know, compound movements, squats, lunges, you know, et cetera, they found that their quads would just take over and they would develop asymmetry from front to back. Um, and in, what ended up happening is we, a few of those competitors really showed well by isolating using our machine and in addition to changing some of their program, but we were a, a part of that um, to the point that we had one competitor driving an hour and a half each way just to do four sets of 20 on the gluteator, which still makes me giggle to this day. <laughs> um, but what ended up happening is we got into this the bikini market for competition and then it kind of spilled into modeling just a little bit. And as I mentioned, I'm a functional biomechanist. I'm an injury biomechanist. This was not my area. I was uncomfortable. I didn't know. I didn't know the industry. So, you know, I'm running around asking all kinds of questions, you know, trying not to be, you know, the creepy old guy trying to, you know, <laughs> talk to all these bikini competitors. But we learned a tremendous amount. And in a very short period of time, and as I mentioned, our fairy godmother introduced us like, you two, Kent and I, do no, no longer in the booth. You guys need to step out of the booth. You need to put attractive people in the booth. Um, I have a face for radio. And the, so the joke became these young bikini competitors were speaking to young competing bikini competitors in our booth. And we just saw a, a complete change in yeah. who we were in that first industry. So what's really interesting is you you create am I correct in saying that you created this product without really a firm target customer in mind you just thought you know what this is going to be an excellent device to strengthen and improve the health of the glutes um like nothing else can in the market right now uh, and so was that your very was that your approach really or, or did you have kind of customers in mind when you when you did it so as the story goes, um, most of it happened before I was on board, but my business partner, Kent, um, has several patents and uh, several of his products are mainstream today with the bioangular stuff. And we can talk about that if you'd yeah. like, but I, um, the, the original idea or concept of the gluteator started with a textbook, um, the textbook is becoming obsolete, giving way to um, online and Google. But he was flipping through a textbook and he noticed that the, glute, the gluteus maximus fibers ran at an angle approximately 45 on most people and realized that it was not limited to a single plane of motion. Therefore, if you trained it in just sagittal or just frontal, you may be missing out on certain concepts. The other thing about Ken, I got to go back one step, is he's a huge, huge follower of Arthur Jones. He found Arthur Jones as a teenager and basically read everything he could get his hands on and became a devout Arthur Jones fan early in life. And so his his fixation with the developing the perfect machine and the history of Nautilus and the history of MedX and all that that goes into it definitely factored into the equation. But um, so by looking at a textbook, he noticed the fiber direction and started to question whether we could build a better mousetrap. Could we build a better glute machine that wasn't isolated to a single plane of motion? That the complexity of the gluteus maximus and the fiber directions in trying to recruit more muscle fiber. And so if you go to like ArthurJonesExercise.com, look up the first bulletin and second chapter, he mentions this in 1970 something um, way back when is the ability to recruit more muscle fiber per a repetition. And he's talking about um, unidirectional versus bidirectional resistance way back when Kent just figured out how to do it. 
and we hold the patents on bidirectional resistance as a result of blah, blah, blah. But that's how the whole thing started was this this concept of building a better machine. Once we proved it was better, okay, and that's a loose term, but once we found out that it actually isolates the glutes, you don't load the back, you don't load the knees, so it can become a glute-specific exercise, then it was a matter of, okay, who's going to buy this darn thing? You know, who's, who, who is in the market for a glute machine? The bikini competitors just happened to find us first. Yeah, I think um, – I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I think uh, I, I think the machine is is um, a clearly very, very effective and, um, and a lot of thought and effort has gone into it. But it's almost like you did things the reverse because um, I'm sure you've heard this, but a lot of savvy business people will tell you, find your market first, you know, find out what they need and then create it. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of people make the mistake of making it first and then obviously having no one to sell it to. But it sounds like you got a tiny bit lucky um, with that. You know, it sounds like, you know, you got that interest and it's really, you know, starting to take off, which is really cool. Um, I mean, I guess a lot of people would have seen your idea and been like, that will definitely sell because it's it's just, it, it, well, from what I understand, it doesn't exist. It didn't exist before you created it. Um, so the deals seem to be pretty good, I suppose. You know, what's funny is, initially when we first started, I can tell you two stories in particular, being at a conference or, or a situation where we are standing in a booth, everybody initially wanted to change what it did. Really? Um, they wanted, they were pointing out what it wasn't instead of what it was. And it was really interesting as I sat there and listened. And at the time I didn't have enough, whatever, I didn't have I didn't want to shoot anybody down at that point because I, I wanted to hear what people really had to say about the machine. Now I can listen to somebody and say, yes, but here's what we were thinking. Then I just kind of absorbed everything. And so we were at a conference and we just had people going, you know, this, this, this. And, and finally, we had one uh, one gentleman from Strive Fitness come over and he's like, do what you do. Don't listen. Do what you do. And I always remember that because he pulled me aside. He said, I know you're frustrated today. He goes, but you have a good product. Yeah. Just believe, just keep going because eventually people will figure out what you are. And it was, it was one of those things. It's funny how timely sometimes just a conversation can change your mindset. And that was one of them. And then the other one, we were at a, um, at a coach's clinic. Um, for football in the state of Texas, which is um, a really big deal. And we had a gentleman who was standing off at a distance and he and his assistant coaches were having a good time at our expense. There was a lot of laughter. There was a lot of jokes. There was a lot of um, inappropriate comments. Let's just put it there. And, you know, being stand, limited to a 10 by 10 booth and not having the ability to counter was a, it was a very humbling experience for me. And as I'm sitting there kind of seething, we had a gentleman um, by the name of Larry Brown, who was a, a former NFL uh, Super Bowl MVP walk over and just had a very just honest conversation. He's like, look, fellas, they don't get it they don't understand. And he's like, I've been through strength conditioning programs from high school to pros. They don't understand. Just keep doing what you're doing. And so those two conversations um, in the moment were stuff that where I was incredibly frustrated, um, almost defeated, where I had somebody just kind of pat us on the back and say, you know, keep going forward, keep going forward, keep going forward. And it was appreciative. I mean, we were amazingly appreciative because if those hadn't happened, we probably would have been a lot more frustrated walking away from those events. Yeah, that's amazing. And good for you for like sticking to your guns and uh, sticking with it. Um, you know, I do also think that it can be dangerous because a lot of the people giving you the criticism, you know, whilst you should always be open to constructive criticism, it's if they're not a target market or a user of the product – then a lot of the times it's not that useful to you. And it's, it's having the ability to, to, to discern when it's useful, when it's not. That's a real skill, I think. Well, the, the moment for me was, the, if we go back to the football reference, 
So I'm going to go back to a little bit of our history. At the time I met Kent, who's a huge Arthur Jones um, follower, I had the opportunity to walk into the Houston Texans weight room where I met Dan Riley. And Dan Riley, if you go back and pull Arthur Jones's book, he wrote the last chapter. Um, he was at West Point when Arthur Jones did a lot of the original Nautilus research in the early 70s. And so Dan um, is is never short on an opinion. He will always tell you what he's thinking. And sometimes you don't, you know, it's hard to listen to him sometimes. So what ended up happening is I've got here, I've got Kent telling me one thing, and then I've got Dan kind of reinforcing it. And I'm, I come from a different background. I'm more sport performance. I was a, I was a Olympic lifter. I have a different background, but I still was based in strength. So these conversations, even though we're in the same genre, were difficult for me to always listen and follow along. And I had to go back and do a ton more research and look at stuff. So anyway, I've got Dan who, who's, who's a strength conditioning coach. Washington Redskins is really where he really cut his teeth in the NFL level. But what ended up happening is one day I get a phone call from a strength conditioning coach at the NFL level. And they now have the machine, the gluteator, in their weight room. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers. And the, the gentleman that we spoke to was a guy by the name of Marcel um, Pasteur. And as Mar Marcel and I are talking, I just go, do you know Dan Riley? And he goes, yeah, he mentored me in college. And I go, yes. I go, it makes sense because you speak the same language that he speaks. And so because of this relationship and Dan's philosophies coming from Arthur and it's all coming together in this perfect little world. Our machine ended up in the Steelers weight room. And there's two comments that, that Marcel made that really kind of gave me confidence that we're more legit than I thought we, than, than at that time thought. And one was, we're tired of getting these college athletes who can squat 700 pounds and can't fire their glutes. That was a, that was prior to them receiving the gluteator. And so, and I was like, you know, so I, I knew the glutes, you know, you could, you could squat without really utilizing them. I knew all that information, but I just didn't realize at that level it was, it was an issue. And then post gluteator, they'd had it for about a month, maybe six to eight weeks. And the comment that I got back was, your machine does exactly what we wanted it to do. It shows us who's not using their glutes um, because they may be able to press a ton of weight or they may be able to fire their um, – fire move a heavy weight, but they're not using their glutes to do it because of the deficiency on your machine. They can't move – an adequate amount of weight and hold it, sustain it, control it, all the other stuff that our machine is known for. And so it, it, it made me realize that this machine has a purpose within the functional world as well, or the medical or the community of, of um, strength development for functional purposes, strength development for medicinal purpose, strength development for the idea of increasing strength either to use in athletics, use in elderly fall prevention, or use for metabolic purposes to increase health benefits. That was the story that got me going that way. Cool. Awesome. So no, that's really cool. Um, I, I wanted to, I'm, I'm, you know, into business. So I wanted to learn about the, the, the business story. And I'm always interested in understanding, you know, how you guys are um, going to market and things like that. But I'm also really keen to learn about the machine and about some of those things you talked about in terms of why it's effective and how it um, stimulates the different muscle groups. Um, one thing you started talking about when we were offline, which has really kind of piqued my interest, was how it compares to a leg press and how you felt there were some potential problems with the leg press. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? I can go leg press and I can go squat. Um, I probably know the squat argument better than I know the leg press argument. And then, and people are always going to jump in this and, and have opinions. And that's the thing about um, analyzing these exercises. This is what I know or this is what um, – um, I believe to be true until somebody proves me otherwise. But um, I believe that knee extensors are dominant um, and you're only as strong as your weakest link and therefore your low back becomes probably the weak link in the process. I believe that most people, um, uh, the glute is not an agonist muscle or a primary muscle. 
as much as the general public believes that it is during either leg press or squat. And the reason, and people always talk about how modifying your feet, modifying your body can change that. And I get all that, but I think the average person tends to load their knee extensors, um, predominantly over their hip extensors during a squat. And, and we can talk about, you know, deadlifting or hip hinging and all that stuff becomes part of this equation. And I get that, but you know, the idea that just because you're extending your hip makes your glutes primary, it's just a fallacy. It's not true. Um, is, for there a, star- is there like a, oh, sorry, is there, um, I'm just curious, is there a, a body of evidence? Um, I mean, I know that the evidence for resistance training is pretty naff, but like, is there um, any evidence to support that, um, what you're saying so that, you know, the, the thought that the, the glutes aren't the uh, prime antagonist or muscle in the leg press? <laughs> There's a study from, believe it or not, I think it's 1973, and I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, we've cited it on our social media, and I and um, I found it prior to uh, Chris Beardsley, but Chris Beardsley's actually put it up on Strength and Conditioning, um, which he does a wonderful job of educating. Yeah. Um, phenomenal. Um, I'm very uh, blessed to have found him because he he's like the Cliff Notes version for strength conditioning and it's appreciated in such a way that I just I always look forward to to his posts. Um, but there's a there's an article that appeared from 1973 that looks at the mechanical advantage or the moment arm of the gluteus maximus in 90 degrees of hip of hip flexion, and it basically shows that the the glute maximus is inefficient at that point. It's just not, and one of the reason why hip you know, what people are calling hip thrusting today that I learned back in the 90s is terminal hip extension. Um, but it's but um, Dr. Contreras has coined the phrase hip thrusting, and therefore that's what people know it as. The glutes are primary at that last 30 degrees of range of motion based on its, its moment arm um, relationship to the hip joint center. That being the case, it makes sense to train the glutes through um, a terminal hip extension or, or um, um, that zero to 30 degrees range, if you will. At 90 degrees or less, what you start to see is that the, the gluteus maximus actually becomes somewhat in, inefficient and you have to do some sort of modification to improve that mechanical advantage or improve that mechanical relationship with the object that you're moving. Now, some people are just – biomechanically designed to squat better. They just get natural recruitment. That's, I, in my opinion, and the little bit that I've seen, that's in the minority, not the majority. Um, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> so many questions going up for me. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I understand most of what you're saying. Uh, I know that some people listening won't, we, we haven't got time to define all of the terms that you're that you're talking about, but I think mm-hmm. majority will understand, so that's fine. Um, and if people want to, you know, look it up, they can Google it. Um, but you know, just thinking about the leg press, and you mentioned there when you're at that kind of ninety degrees, you're at the starting position of the leg press. Um, now, correct if I say anything incorrect here. Um, when I'm coming out of the gate, the leg press at the start, I personally, and maybe this is a, like you say, a very individual thing, I feel a lot of tension in my glutes and in my hamstrings, mm-hmm. mostly my glutes, not so much my hamstrings, maybe, uh, maybe a bit of both. Um, and obviously that feels like it becomes a more quad dominant towards the end of that range of motion in the leg press. Now, you said there that there's not as much stimulation or very little in the glutes at that starting point of the leg press now am i feeling that because that's something you know uh personal to me or psychological or you know what's your take on that um great question the now when you say the start you're talking about where your knees are closer to your chest not that's right not okay okay well i just want to make sure we're on the same page um the the stretch that you feel, the passive tension is what's going to get the glute more activated, okay? Um, that's what actually causes. And so if somebody is, you know, they have to be able to hold that position at the bottom to get that passive tension. I also believe – so that's mechanical. And I also believe there's something mixed up, and this is not my area of specialty, so if I'm out of bounds, somebody correct me. 
But I believe there is validity in this whole idea of muscle to mind in, um, connection and the internal cueing that is required to get certain muscles to fiber. I've seen research that supports it tremendously, not an, an area that I've spent a lot of time studying, but because we're in the game now, I have to, to try to understand it better. But I just go to our, psych, our, our exercise psychologists and say, talk to me about this. Like, what's going on? What do we do? But there's research out there that supports you do one set of bench press with um, um, EMGs on your chest and you can get the, the, the pec muscles activated. Do the second set and the EMGs are on your triceps and you can get the triceps even more activated just by putting mind to muscle interaction. So there's a there's something there. And I and and. I don't know enough to, to, to be scholarly on that topic, but if you take the leg press, just leg press versus squat, the barbell on the shoulders versus the pad that is supporting the back has taken out one of the major responsibilities of the glute, which is control of the passenger, which is the upper body. So because you're, you're going to, you're going to naturally get more glute activity during squat, just because you're supporting the upper body by the upper gluteal muscles. Um, that is supporting the upper gluteal fibers, I should say, that is actually supporting the torso more efficiently. And then you get into the whole idea of hitting the bottom part of the movement and this, this concept of butt winking or posterior pelvic tilting. Um, that's a whole nother level of, of science that needs to be understood is terms of glute activation and posterior pelvic tilting. Does it increase Glute, act, glute activity or does it diminish or does it take away form? Does it put too much pressure or shear forcing or compression forcing on the back? These are all open for debate or discussion. And I've done my my research on it just so I feel comfortable in where our machine fits into the argument. So, and there will be, it's, it's always difficult to talk about um, exercise on a podcast. And I think that's one of the reasons why YouTube's really taken off in health and fitness because it's so much to, to visually see exercise or people describing something and then seeing it performed is, 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 is often a lot easier for people. Um, so with that said, there will be videos and demonstrations of the gluteator and other things we talk about on the blog post for this, um, which will be over at corporatewarrior.co forward slash Dynavec, D-Y-N-A-V-E-C. But I'll say that again in case you missed that at the end. Um, but let's just talk about you know the machine for a second. Um, do you want to just explain how the gluteator works in terms of the bidirectional resistance and all of that? Absolutely. Um, essentially, when you look at any machine or most machines developed, if it's a true machine, not a cable machine, but a true machine, you have an axis of rotation. Um, some machines will line up that axis of rotation with the specific joint. So for example, like a leg extension machine will line up with the knee. Um, the idea you put your the knee joint center in line with the axis rotation of the machine, and that gives you a more um, efficient uh, resistance or strength curve. Um, what the gluteator, when it was built, we put one axis of rotation through the hip joint from sagittal plane, so um, lateral to the hip. The other axis of rotation is inferior to the hip, um, which causes frontal plane motion if you move. And so by vectoring those two together, it creates a unique or specific movement pattern for most people's glutes. Um, it doesn't fit every single person but we have tried to build a machine that will that like most machines it'll fit the masses it won't fit every single body but it will fit the masses and what happens is is the joint action simultaneously will be hip extension coupled with a b hip abduction and that that coupling increases motor unit recruitment and therefore muscle fiber um, firing um, and it's it is unique in the sense that it will it will isolate your bottom in a way that is not easily replicated in a weight room. We've very similar to say doing you know uh, squatting with bands around your knee. You're going to get an isometric contraction and abduction, and you're going to get a load through um, a load from the bar during uh, sagittal plane motion or hip extension. It's what makes our machine unique is that most of the load is handled 
the load is actually handled equally across both planes. It's vectored that way. And so what ends up happening is you get a, a real intense glute contraction um, through about 35 degrees of range of motion, 45 degrees of hip abduction, and then coupled with about 20, 25 degrees, depending on the person, through hip extension. By creasing hip extension and then bringing abduction into it, it causes more recruitment across the glutes. And that's why why it works. Nice. I remember um, I was watching a video from Bill Crawford over at Basic Training uh, demoing it. And uh, I thought the most profound thing he said is uh, – you will feel a burn from this that you've never felt from any other machine, which is quite a statement when there have been some obviously uh, incredible machines um, over the years. Uh, so that was quite quite the statement. So um, when you also, I haven't used this machine yet, and I'm, I wish I, I wish I, I could, and I'm sure I will in the in the future at some point. Um, but are you are you basically where, where are you feeling? Is it is it is is the tension that you're feeling pretty much completely in the glutes? Where else are you feeling in your lower body? Uh, or upper body, the you know the stimulus when you're doing this. Um, back to Bill Crawford real quick. Bill was one of those individuals who found us early, um, and then we kept trying to touch base and trying to t- touch base with him. And finally, he just called. They said, "All right, I need to I need to try this machine." And so uh, we worked out a situation where we got him a machine, and and um, and he's been a, he's been pivotal for us to somebody who has spent his entire career on machines and has worked closely with people in the hit industry and he's influential, he's knowledgeable, he's a great guy. But he was one of those, my favorite line from that video is a baseball bat, um, is my favorite line from that video. If you go back and watch it, he says it's like somebody hit you in the backside with a baseball bat. (laughs) Yeah, I remember that. Um, but, but, like going into Bill's place, I mean, it's it was um, you you know he's immediately a machine guy, and that's real obvious as soon as you spend any time into his facility. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and use that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively, 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast 
to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Back to the question that you asked. Um, refresh me again, please. No, I was just curious, you know, um, I mean, I, I may be, uh, I may, this may not be a great question, but uh, obviously this this targets the glutes. Uh, but I'm just curious where you feel tension in a body. I mean, it's so hard, even if the most well-designed machines, to isolate muscle groups. Because as we know, muscles are so closely entwined when training that it is very difficult. Um, so I just wondered, you know, where does one feel tension when they're doing this exercise? Is there tension anywhere in the upper body and where else in the lower body? I mean, how does it feel? Okay. So to answer your question, um, your glutes are complex. There is at least two fiber directions in the gluteus maximus. And then you throw the medius and minimus on top of that. And many people um, in the community think that, or not in the community, but in weight rooms think if you go frontal plane motion for the hip joint, that's automatically gluteus, medius, and minimus. Um, it is if your leg um, is extended. So if your leg is straight, then gluteus, medius, and minimus are primary or agonist muscle group. If you flex the hip close to 90 degrees, the gluteus maximus is your primary AB doctor. And so many people don't realize that, and that's why they look at our machine and think it's an AB doctor machine. So what we do is you can actually manipulate – if you know your body really, really, really well um, – what I mean by that is it's fun for us to watch people who are, have high fitness levels, um, who know their body well, who train consistently. They can they feel the experience within a few reps. Um, there's there is a little bit of a learning curve, but once they get that, they can feel it. Now, to answer your question honestly, I can manipulate. I've been playing with this machine so long, I can actually start to change your target areas by causing you to either um, move slow through entire range of motion, pausing or isometrically contracting at the distal end of the movement. I can actually start to get you to feel the fibers in the upper portion start to contract a little bit more. Um, maybe it's mind to muscle. Maybe it's me playing witch doctor i'm not sure but i can we can start to play with that um like right now the pittsburgh steelers are working on um heavier loads and the initiation of movement and then you will actually feel it lower on the gluteus maximus and you'll actually start to feel um more where the tie-in occurs or more the lower section or lower fibers so if you've had this machine for a while you can actually start to distinguish fiber levels, if you will, or directions of fiber directions in terms of upper gluteal maximus, medius minimus contributing during slow controlled full range of motion isometric at the terminal end or the heavier loads, the initiation of movement. And we've been, I've been playing with this for a while now. We have yet to hook up EMGs because we've been it's um, I don't have the EMG machine at the house. I have it at the office. And so, um, but I can tell you from just playing with it, my business partner prefers to keep the reps really high, the weight low, given the fiber type of the Maximus and working to extreme fatigues or exhaustion at that point and making sure that the entire glute is recruited. Um, and I don't disagree with his method. Sometimes people don't have that kind of time, though. Would you argue that, I mean, you talked about on your website how it changes the role of the, the glutes to uh, from a neutralizer or synergist to agonist or primary muscle, for those that don't know what agonist means. Um, is it the only machine on the market that you know that does this? Um, I, you probably don't want sense, to promote anyone else. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. It's, I, and like I said, I'm a scientist first. And so if there's an... I know that through our research and what we've done that the in, in what what's interesting and I'll talk about it from a banded squat or a banded terminal hip extension. I'll talk about it from that point of view because it's easier to understand. What happens is is that people don't realize how much of an AB ductor the glute maximus is. And so by getting it turned on, activated if you will, prior to a complex lift or compound lift, 
what you will start to see or feel actually is the glute contributes a little bit more and research definitely supports that. So we've been flirting. A matter of fact, right before you and I got on, I've been, I was coaching a guy out of um, Nebraska to use the gluteator right before his compound lifts. Now what's interesting about him is he was a surgery candidate has, he's in therapy mode and he's just the tail end uh, he's actually been released by therapy, but he's continuing his self therapy. If that if that makes sense, mm-hmm. he's actually using the gluteator as a therapy tool to activate his glutes to improve his posture and his glute activation during the compound movements. So I believe that yes, there are other ways to do it. I just think that we have a time interest efficiency in the argument. I think you can get more done in less time, and that seems to be fall in line with certain communities within the strength industry really, really well, um, is that I can get done uh, in a very short period of time what you can put a banded body weight exercise and 50 to 100 reps later, you fatigue the tissue and we can do it in 20 or less reps. Yeah, uh, that that message right there would resonate so much with most of my listeners uh, who, you know, for uh, for the most part or many of them um, – are drawn to high intensity strength training because of, because of its efficiency. Um, you know, a lot of them are training, you know, once or twice a week, you know, one set to failure, uh, all run businesses that promote that type of training to the busy execs. Um, so that's why I feel like this would be such a good fit for a lot of those types of businesses. One second. In continuation of what you just said, mm. Bryce Lee, which is yeah. at a strength space um, in Chesapeake, Virginia, he just released um, on social media just uh, this weekend was talking about a little weight on the gluteator goes a long way. And those are my words, not his, but I'm paraphrasing what his message was. And he's been really good for us. And just in terms of having conversations and looking things from a slightly different point of view, he's really challenged us and it's appreciated tremendously because he has a unique view and coming from the therapy world and his passion for strength equipment is, is evident. But when you start looking at, you know, how little weight actually caused such a demand on the tissue he did in on video he did in several seconds his entire glute workout for the week per his words not not ours um a bikini model for example they have found that if they hit it multiple times same volume but multiple times during the week the results tends to be more aesthetically pleasing which is highly anecdotal, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> no, I understand. I just was putting it out there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, if if people could see your your reaction, your your body language as you said that, it was one of I'm I'm skeptical, but you know, whatever works for them. Um, no, Bryce is a great guy. He's uh, been a listener of the show for for a long time, actually. Uh, and actually, he was on the podcast recently, and that will be that will be out actually when this one's this one's published. So that would have already be uh, you know in the uh, on the internet. Um, one of the things you mentioned on the website as well, and you actually, I think you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, was how your machine reduces joint shearing. Can you mm. elaborate on what that means and then describe how the machine reduces that? Okay, so when we first released that, it was we were speculating. We actually hadn't tested it. Um, to test it, you have to have dynamic MRIs um, or pre-post um, X-rays of somebody who, say, has dysfunction or or um, uh, a malnormity in their in their the the joint how the head of the femur interacts with the acetabulum. Um, I've have I can om- I can more answer the question in stories. Um, we have not done direct measurements because we don't have access to a dynamic MRI. But if you go back to Dr. Chris Powers, um, USC physiotherapist, physical therapist. Um, they did a lot of this stuff with uh, dynamic MRIs and the relationship between the patella and the femur. Um, and it was fascinating to me. I was a young scientist in the audience and he was telling his life story. And it, it, it just like made sense to me because I was looking at the hip joint from his knee joint perspective. But the first individual who really brought this to light was actually my business partner who has hip issues. And um, he is now in his 60s and consequently through developed strength using his own product. So his opinion becomes incredibly biased if anybody wants to listen to it. But he is actually able to 
um, function at a very high level for somebody with his condition. Um, he attributes it directly to strength main- maintenance through his own device. And, you know, it, and I, I, so I'd heard the stories and I, and I, and I didn't disagree with them, but at the same time, I'm like, your opinion is incredibly biased. Um, secondary to that, my mother has SI joint issues. Um, as a result of glute strength, she is now able to walk um, with less um, pathology, if you will. She's she's got a better gait as a result of which takes pressure off of the other joints in the system. But the real first client who got it was um, uh, Justine um, uh, in um, Lincoln, Delaware. And she was a um, hip joint replacement candidate, had spent years training. She's high level bodybuilding. She's very into, but into her competitions, but she had to stop because of, of how much discomfort she had in her hip. Her leg length discrepancy at the time of surgery was over an inch. And as she came back from surgery, she and I worked together um, on her therapies and and I worked in conjunction with her coaches as she was released from therapy. And what we found is, is that she increased strength through her glutes. She reduced the amount of pain she was experiencing in the joints. And that alone started to really confirm the joint shearing and minimizing normal patterns and, and changing um, wear patterns within the, the femoral, femoral head. Recently, Mike Petrella, who's also been on this show, and he's out of STG Strength and Power up in uh, Ontario, his um, girlfriend is going through a similar situation that Kent deals with. And so that's independent of our company, independent of our, our, our biases, if you will. And she has been a big advocate for what the machine is capable of doing in the sense that it's changed her uh, projected joint replacement surgery by several years per their words, not ours, per their words. And so that was, those were all things that lead us to believe and feel very comfortable with the idea of increasing strength around the joint and minimizing the amount of load or distribution of load through the actual ball socket relationship. So I'm interested now because, um, you know, what type of exercises do you feel could be quite harmful over the long term then? Um, You know, similar to all those that target glutes. So for instance, you know, I've had, um, you know, I've had a, a comment from a, a, a biomechanics expert before mentioned to me that a single legged squat puts a lot of force on the hip. Um, and they, you know, I was actually having a, a minor bit of hip pain at the time. And this is why I reached out to him. Um, and, but I, at the time I was playing a lot of basketball. So, you know, there's a lot of confounders, right? So, um, it's difficult to say what was causing it, but now that I've stopped, well, it's not, <laughs> maybe it's not because now that I'm not playing so much basketball, I have no hip pain whatsoever. Uh, and we all know that sports are bad. So there you go. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm digressing here, but I'm just curious, you know, what's your thoughts around something like a single legged squat? Um, do you feel like that could cause joint issues over the long term? Um, Okay, it's my, assuming you're controlling for volume and frequency, yeah. and not overdoing it, right? I'm going to go. My professional opinion on this one is, and it, the way that I look at things are strength and skill, and it, it's a very simple way of looking at it. But it helps me to um, segregate what possible issues could arise. If someone is lacking strength then they're going to compromise skill. And at that point, a single leg squat could become injurious. I'm under the assumption that if you have structural integrity of all the joints, of adequate muscle strength, it's less likely to be injurious. So what's interesting about it, because as soon as you develop a skill, you or as soon as you develop strength for a skill, you're actually developing the skill as well. And so it's it's one of those really weird arguments because it can get 
muddy quickly. But in my mind, if you separate strength and skill and then attack each one individually, you'll get closer to reducing any sort of exercise um, or causing injury. I think what happens today in my mind is a lot of compromising of exercise. In other words, there's the blending of strength and skill at the same time. And so, you know, some is good, more is better. And we're doing all kinds of of exercises that involve a strength and skill component simultaneously without adequate strength through the particular tissue that you're loading. And if you're not strong enough through that tissue, then you're going to have a compensatory movement as a result of possibly leading to pathology. So it's it's a it's a really really interesting argument it's one that i enjoy tremendously because there's a lot of confounding factors that you have to consider before you even get to the topic that you've asked so do i think the do i i think any exercise in a weight room can be possibly become injurious if you don't have adequate strength levels or proper skill to be able to perform the movement without compromising and i i see it all the time where you get young Young lifters coming in, they're trusting that their buddy knows what they're doing and they start teaching them the exercise and you just look at how they're how they're compensating. And I'm one of those people that have to put blinders on in a weight room because I'll spend my entire time correcting everyone's form. Awesome. So um, just to clarify then, because I'm I'm that, that was really interesting, but I'm not sure if we've actually defined what joint shearing exactly is. So let's just should we just touch on that quickly. I mean, maybe I, you have it. I missed it. Joint shearing just it, it comes down to, um, for example, you have certain bones. The easiest one to identify is the elbow. The elbow is a bone to bone joint. You have you have um, you have a load that goes through bone to bone. The best way to, to to define shearing forces is to look at the spine during a squat. So if you are perfectly standing straight upright with a load across your shoulders, you're going to have compression forces. As soon as I drop into, say, a good morning position or a parallel um, a parallel squatted position, you're going to have increased for shearing across. When you look at it at the hip joint, it's how the joint is is absorbing or utilizing that load. Is it is there structural sh- integrity of the joint? Is there muscular strength in the joint? Are they actually distributing the load proficiently or effectively across without causing pinching or structural issues within the joint as a result of? That's the way that I look at it. I know there's probably a better way to define that, but in my mind, that's what makes the most amount of sense. See, that's one of those questions I ask, and I don't have a clue how complex it's really going to be until you start talking about it. Um, but no, that's uh, that makes much more sense to me. And well, I am. Um, when I started my PhD, um, I I just moved to Texas from California, and I I have this habit of just finding out who the players in the game are. And I went and met with the orthopedic surgeon for um, several of the professional uh, Dallas teams. And and first thing he says is, I don't let my athletes squat. And I have a big squat background. I was a competitive Olympic style lifter. I, you know, I've always been, my strength has always been in my lower body. I've been obsessed with lower body power most of my life. And I was just, I, I, I was like, am I wrong? Like, am I wrong? Do I need to go back? And so, you know, Dr. Tio Soriel is who it was. And that was his philosophy at the time. I don't know if it's the same or if it's changed, but I remember having that conversation with him. And I just walked away from that conversation perplexed because I'm like, well, how do you, how do you, what do you do to, you know, squats or squats? You need them. And then as I've gotten better and, and older, I'm like, maybe there's a way around it. Do we minimize that squatting isn't for everyone when you start looking at segmental lengths and, and like you said, the joint, how if it's, retroversion, antiversion, there's a whole nother host of issues that you have to understand before you can even make a general recommendation. That's right. And I remember Mike saying that he always felt he was too tall for too tall for squatting, which is why he's always preferred the leg press. Uh, and I'm sure now the gluteator is uh, fitting quite nicely into his workout regimen. 
Um, so no, it's certainly not right for everyone. And, and you know, you hear it a lot on, especially on YouTube and a lot of the kind of bro sciencey people talking about, oh, you've got to do squats and deadlifts. Squats and deadlifts are the mainstay of everyone's, uh, you know, workout regime if they want to maximize hypertrophy. And it just is not true. Um, and it's not necessarily sustainable over the long term for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, not, not the first to say that probably, but, um, I don't know if you, do, do you agree with that? generally speaking? Well, what's funny is, you know, as scientists, oftentimes we have to separate ourselves from what our own personal biases are. You know, um, like, for example, in my lifetime, uh, I love Olympic style lifting. I enjoy it. It's athletic. It's competitive. I enjoyed every minute of it. But is it the best thing that I would put my, say, basketball team through? No. No, it would not. It's, it's, you know, most of my athletes don't have the strength base to be able to do Olympic style lifting successfully. And I've seen it too many times in too many weight rooms. So I work on strength foundations well before I ever get into ballistic lifting. And I don't think that that is the popular opinion amongst most of our strength coaches in this country at the high school and college level. And so you have to take your own personal bias and figure out what is best for my client. And for my clients or my customers or my patients or my ath- my athletes, it always comes down to do they have the strength necessary to perform what it is they need to perform either in this weight room or transfer out to the field diamond court track pitch that they are participating on does that make sense it does no it does absolutely um i want to i'm just um, i'm aware of time and i'm really keen to um talk more about the business aspects from the from the perspective of the business owner listening to this who may be interested in uh purchasing a gluteator or any of your other devices um you know, you've talked, I guess, at length, I think you've given some good support behind the rationale why, you know, a business owner might want to buy a gluteator to add to their, you know, add to their kind of um, machine range. Um, what's been your experience, you know, working with um, some of the organizations in the high intensity space? You know, you mentioned Bryce and people like Mike, um, you know, what's been, what's been their reasons for um, adding this to their repertoire? Because, you know, I know you've, I suppose you spoke at length in terms of, um, you know, other machines perhaps not being so effective at, um, you know, activating or, or, or targeting the glutes as a agonist muscle. But, you know, a lot of, uh, these guys already have, you know, in, in some cases a, a big range of machines and techniques. So what, what was it for them that they said to you, that was the reason they, 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 they purchased it. Um, we've heard some really great stories over the years. Um, for the most part, um, membership does increase when a gluteator is introduced. And that's been most of the owners who've been transparent with us post-purchase um, that it does attract. Now, sustainability and how much longer, um, we've been told that it basically paid for itself within the first three to six months, depending on the location that it went into. How it fits in is I believe that the gluteator does target a muscle that is incredibly popular right now. And I can argue, um, like I said, from aesthetics to the elderly, um, my background is elderly fall prevention. And I can tell you why strong glutes will help, you know, grandma or grandpa not fall down um, in terms of balancing the uh, the passenger, the upper body and in, in, in preventing a fall from occurring. Um, but in terms of Fitting into a market, what I've learned about the hit community, which has been really fun, is we're probably more similar to the individuals who are buying a gluteator in the hit market than we are in a bikini competitor market. We're just not competing com- bikini competitors, so therefore we had to learn to relate to what their issues and their problems were. Um, when we initially got recognized by bodybuilding.com on a blog called cost is no object, we were rated the top glute machine that money could buy. And what was fun for that is for, a, for us, for a, a moment in time, several weeks, several months, actually, um, we were having these amazingly, um, in depth conversations about the mechanics of a machine and, and, and we had them at different levels in different countries. And I realized there's this whole group of people out there who are fanatical about their equipment. And it was, it was a 
blast because then we could relate to their intensity. We understood it. We got it. You know, and that's I think in the strength industry, it is a powerful minority, but it is still incredibly intense to listen to somebody who has that level of passion and understands the science of why these machines are valuable and valid within the industry. Those are my thoughts. Right. Okay, cool. Um, What do you think? You know, okay, so that's interesting. So I didn't expect you to say that it would improve um, potentially with customer acquisition and greater retention, maybe in members. Uh, But I guess that kind of makes sense if they see that something that's, you know, quite, uh, they, they, you know, not every gym is stocking these right now, right? So if someone goes to a facility and they see they have a gladiator and maybe they see a demo on it and told all this really targets the, you know, the butt. Um, that's a real selling point, I suppose. So no, I don't think about it like that, but that's cool. Well, what, it, what we try to do is we're, we're still small in sales. I mean, we're not, we're a, a small company or, or if you will, a hobby, probably trying to become a company. So what we have found is we really try to get behind the companies who are purchasing. So we try to advertise as much as we can. We try to send out, um, uh, interest, if you will, within people within the community that that gluteator was just purchased. We know it's effective because if we send a machine to a particular city, we know that within about three to four weeks, we'll start getting inquiries from that city of other rival gyms. That's when we know that we're starting to, um, we're getting recognized because all of a sudden the competition sees that this other gym has this piece in that that p they're starting to lose membership to that other gym because they have something that is of value to the average customer or patron of that gym and that's when we really started to notice that there we might have a product of 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 value for the smaller gym owner is where we really that's our demographic. That's the, the smaller gym owners who is, who's really trying to stand out above and beyond the big box um, mentality of fitness. There's plenty of those, those types of listening to this. So um, yeah, you may find, you may get some inquiries following this, who knows? Um, so tell us more about the, the, you know, how much do these, these costs, how do people go about actually purchasing these machines? <laughs> Because we're still a small company and both my business partner and I have day jobs, um, he has his, uh, he has his initial business and then I work as a professor. Um, we, we go through the website. So if you want to get a hold of us, go through our website and I'm sure you're going to list that, um, um, when this is released. But if you go to the website, um, there's a, an opportunity for you to inquire. I'll, it's me who will get back to you. I answer each and every one, um, uh, email interest. And um, in terms of cost, we had a full evaluation. We've actually had two done and both both individuals came back in the price point range of thirty-five to four thousand, thirty-five hundred to four thousand dollars. And that we're just not there. Um, our customer, our, our demographic is not there. And so what we're trying to do is hold the cost down as long as, as long as we possibly can. But I don't know if you recently the cost of steel has jumped. And so we it's it bit into our profit margin, but we're trying really hard to keep the cost at three thousand dollars or less is where we're trying to keep it. We also know that um, social media awareness. And so if somebody is willing to buy and help us promote, we're willing to give discounts on top of that because we're only going to grow by word of mouth. We're only going to grow by opportunities. Um, it's not like we're going to take out a national campaign or be on a TV commercial anytime soon. We're growing through people in that say, okay, this thing is legit. This is real. This works. We're not just a myth or a fallacy. This thing actually has merit within the strength industry. And um, I, I, like I said, from, from starting to today, I'm finally really comfortable making statements like that because of the background um, um, that we've been able to obtain by interacting with our customers. Cool. And uh, what about things like logistics? So, I mean, I'm assuming that pretty much all of your customers currently are in the U.S. Oh no, 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 no. Okay. Um, um, what's interesting is um, we had um, Sweden. For some reason, we're incredibly popular in Sweden. Um, we've probably shipped 13 to 15 machines to Sweden. Um, there was an outfit there that uh, that fell in love with us, um, and 
we've been able to ship. We've shipped to Germany. We've shipped to Switzerland. We've shipped to Korea. Um, we just got orders from uh, – we just got an inquiry and possible order from Kuwait. Um, we sent a machine to Qatar, um, but that was our ankle machine actually. Um, which is interesting because I think I probably have, we have more machines in Sweden than we do in Florida, which doesn't make sense to me. Um, just weather wise, um, we still have yet to place a machine in Las Vegas, which I think is our kind of town, um, sarcasm, but we have a few machines in California, which is my home state, which always kind of disappoints me. Um, we're pop more popular in Oregon than we are in California, which again, doesn't make sense, but weather wise, it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but obviously Texas being our home state, we have more machines here than anywhere else. Um, we have yet to move up into the Midwest. Virginia, for some reason, um, has taken a liking to us. And then um, i trying to think else. We've sent a few up to New York. Uh, we've got one in Massachusetts. Um at North Oxford called Prime Fitness or Prime Supplementation and Nutrition. Um, they just they got one up and running. Um, but those are that's kind of our limitation right now in terms of where we're at. We're actually getting more interest internationally than we are domestically, which is not what we are anticipating. And then realistically, probably twenty to twenty five percent of our sales are just home gyms. They're, we've actually moved a lazy boy out of someone's living room to put a gluteator in front of their television. <laughs> that's, no that's a real story. Yeah, that's a real story. Um, it was kind of comical and we got a big kick out of it. Um, but yeah, 20, probably about 20, 25% of our business is, is home gyms. Um, we have one lady in particular has a weekly gluteator party and she invites all her friends over and they serve wine and work on their backside. Very good. So it's people have fun with it. Um, that's good to know. You know, so those listening to this that aren't in the US, because um, obviously, you know, Jeff, the listeners for this podcast are all over the place. Most the US, but there are there are some all over the, the world. And I forgot. Um, and I forgot one country. I forgot Canada. We have several in Canada. Um, cool. Mike Petrella's group being one of them. Yeah. And then Blair Wilson is going to his is going to probably ship here pretty quick. Cool. But. Um, we do. Shipping international is a little bit tricky. Um, yeah. I've learned a lot um, on how to get something to land on foreign soil. It's a lot. It, there's a lot more hoops to jump through, but it doesn't mean we can't figure it out. Um, the the delivery to Kuwait City is going to be quite interesting. We can't find agents to land over there. Okay. But but it, yeah, no, that's cool. But you're you're always interested in trying to make it happen and trying to work that out, which is uh, which is I'm sure music to some people's ears because um, I really do think that the the interest for this is going to just continue to grow. You've got a few other machines as well, uh, which we haven't spoken about. You have a torso yes. systems and an ankle machine as well. Do you want to talk about both of those quickly and just describe how they work? Absolutely. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, the ankle machine is the one we're about to really launch. Um, we now have it evaluated at a professional level. Um, we're looking at the idea of minimizing coupling the gluteator glute strength with strengthening the ankle. Um, if you read a lot of the latest research right now that's coming out about ankle injuries, you will find that glute strength plays a tremendous role in stabilization of the ankle. And I don't think most people realize that. Um, but there's a large body of literature and I'm, I'm right in the middle of that, um, lit review. <coughs> and, um, but our ankle machine does virtually the same thing that the gluteator does. It just does it at the ankle. And what we've coupled together is dorsiflexion and eversion and plantar flexion with inversion. So one machine, two different exercises. Um, there's a little bit of a learning curve with it, but once you get it, you will develop a tremendous amount of strength that supports the ankle joint, which is the first major joint to interact with the floor, um, say on a basketball court or volleyball court or whatnot. Um, it doesn't work just in sagittal plane. So most what's out there is plantar flexion. Hammer strength makes um, an ankle dorsiflexion machine that plate loaded. It, it, it's incredibly effective. But what, what our machine does, especially the dorsiflexion coupled with the eversion, is you get the lateral compartment or the peroneal muscles to fire and it gives you lateral support. Now, looking at a traditional ankle sprain or a high ankle sprain, you will know that um, peroneal muscles 
will play a significant role in the prevention of um, or the recovery of an ankle sprain, um, either directly or indirectly. Um, and then also having that strength will help you, in fact, um, come back quicker per the injury occurring. And so I'm real proud of our ankle machine. And, and in fact, we're going to go uh, sit and chat with um, – we're in negotiations with several Division One universities um, here in the states about looking at uh, ankle strength on our machine on court sports, um, different court sports that um, are played at the NCAA level, basketball, volleyball being primary. Um, and that's so we're incredibly proud of that machine because we think it plays a vital role in in therapeutic um, uh, circles uh, for strength training especially if it's coupled with glute strength, um, whether it's developed on the gluteator or otherwise, we have found that it, it um, based on the literature review that I'm on, it plays a tremendous role in allowing your athletes to recover quicker and be stronger when they do bounce back or come back. Um, comment, you good? No, I was just gonna, to- no, I was gonna say, this sounds like a fantastic piece and I'm sure you get a lot of interest or you sounds like you already have. Uh, from certainly from the athletic community uh, but yeah if you want to talk about the does it torso system is the next one yeah the torso system is my baby it's one that i had the most fun putting together because the other two machines were were near completion when i came on board with dynavec and started working with kent we had yet to fabricate the torso machine and so it was one of those we got to take the science and understand and what i went and did was pulled um, a lot of the old medics research um, in looking at um, human limitations and, and how much rotation could you add to a system and not be injurious. And there was a, um, for liability purposes and, res- you know, we had to really have our ducks in a row, so to speak. And so what we did is we coupled um, about 14, 15 degrees of rotation. So it's transverse plane motion with either extension or flexion. And so what you end up having is a movement where you have a, a right to left rotation as at the same time you are flexing. And so it creates a real intense contraction because you're stabilizing from two points of res, uh, of motion, two axes of, ro- of motion. And then what we do is you can literally pull the weight off, set it on another weight horn and you go – You can go right or left rotation with extension, which gets the backside of your core, if you will, or your rectus spinae to stabilize torso. It's of my belief um, professionally and personally that if you couple the three R3 machines together, your your opportunity for performance – if you look at it from a strength skill point of view, will it be enhanced as a result of, and for a sport, say like golf, where it's from the ground up and you're looking at the rotational component or for hockey, where you're on blades and you have to be able to support yourself ankle up to be able to, um, actively, um, you know, slap a shot or whatever it happens to be is I think that these types of rotational sports, baseball, softball, all kind of factor into this. And I would love to be able to find that weight room where we can couple all three machines together and see what kind of difference we can make. And at the same time, minimize the amount of time they need to, the athlete needs to spend in the weight room. If it works in the athletic population, it'll definitely work in general population. And that's always been my philosophy when working with individuals. And uh, now that's cool. And all of those will be listed in the blog post. But um, what's the future look like then for Dynavec? What do you guys got planned? Any new machines? What's the roadmap for you guys? Um, we're working on a, f- a few other designs. Um, they're too early in conception to be released, but we've got um, we've got some prototypes that we're playing with. Um, any joint that moves in more than one plane of motion um, is fair game for us in terms of using our technology. Um, but we, we're, we're, we're kind of playing, we've had some requests, uh, we're looking at some different ideas, um, in terms of how to couple what we already have with what we think is being neglected within the strength community. Um, and I, and I'm excited. Um, it's anytime you do something new, it's, it's a adren- there's an adrenaline rush that goes with it because you don't want to be wrong. Um, we don't do a lot of CAD drawings. We build prototypes and play on them is what we do. We're kind of, you know, like I said, we're not, 
you know, even though my grandfather was an architect, we don't spend a lot of time drawing. We spend more time building stuff and saying, well, that, 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 and, and we make modifications. And so right now, currently in our shop, we, we we have a few different machine ideas that we're bouncing around, um, three in particular. And at this time, I would prefer not to discuss them just because we don't know if they're ever going to be released. But we, we are always trying to advance the, what we do so we can become more relevant within the profession in terms of we know what we're talking about. We know how to implement this and we do hold the patents for them. And we believe that the machines that we do make already will play a significant role in strength development per each of the joints. Awesome. Jeff, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. What's the uh, best way for the listeners to find out more about you and uh, contact you if you'd like, if you'd like to leave a, you know, a, any contact details, it's completely up to you. Absolutely. Probably our website is the easiest place. You just go um, www.dynavecmd, MD stands for multidirectional, um, dot com. Um, you can get a hold of us there. If you want to send me an email directly, it's just dynavet. Dynavec at outlook.com is the other way that um, any email inquiries I, dir- I directly respond. Um, usually in the evening is when I find time to be able to get to play with them. Um, if you just have questions or just want to comment, please do so. Um, our social media, um, Instagram seems to work the best for us. Facebook um, gives us some. Twitter, I don't, we're not popular enough to, to, um, release our thoughts or our ideas or what we had for lunch. Um, <laughs> so, uh, that's sarcasm. Sorry. And so the Instagram has been the most valuable. And if you go on our Instagram page and you just go surf through whatever it is, the six or 700 posts that we have, you will find that, that all of its content, all of it is trying to show you what the machine does from different different points of view, whether it be the bikini competitor, whether it be the hit style training, whether it be medical or or, um, therapeutic value, um, chiropractic care. um, I really believe that we fit into the chiropractic model. If you take TPI, which is Title Performance Institute, we fit into that as well because of glutes are king. And so when you really investigate what we do, we strengthen the glute without loading the back or the knees. There is tremendous value in that if you understand how to use the tool. Yeah, well said. Cool. And uh, to, for the listeners to find the, the blog post for this episode, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash Dynavec, D Y N A V E C. And for all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook to get a bunch of goodies, including number one, a free ebook of podcast transcripts with some of my top guests like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. Number two, a free high-intensity training business checklist to help you get more clients in your business. And number three, a free high-intensity training Google Sheet to help you track and improve your training progress. Head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook now and enter your email address for instant access. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. 
as well as being utilized by many high intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. 